And we hit 11.40. Uh, welcome to DevOps in Real Life uh, How To. Uh, in the coming session, you're going to listen to me uh, and Jessica about how we work with DevOps at Meltwater uh, and some good cases of what we have found works really good for, for us. So before we take off, let's go through the mandatory slides and give an introduction of who we are. Hi, my name is Jessica. I used to work at Meltwater as an infrastructure engineer on our internal platform team, but starting Monday, I joined a company called Anotel on their platform team instead. But the talk that we're going to talk about, I've been part of the major part of the work for that. Uh, so I feel like I'm, I know what I'm talking about, but when I say we, I probably mean we as the platform team at Meltwater and not we as my future employment, uh, even though it's currently very confusing. I'm also a co-organizer of the meetup group Kubernetes Yet Body here in Gothenburg, and I'm a CNF, uh, CNCF ambassador as well. Okay, cool. Uh, my name is Ola Peterson. Uh, before I give you my background, I want to remind everybody and lean back and say that I'm a Java developer. Uh, I've been working on the JVM throughout all of my career. Uh, working full stack, uh, being involved in the community locally here in Gothenburg. And I've also been around talking at different, usually Java conferences. Um, in 2016, I was awarded with a Java One Rockstar. And that's me. So I'm going to talk a little bit and give you some background to what Meltwater is. Uh, and Meltwater is a product where you are allowed to kind of see what then your brand did on the internet. We build a product where they can search for their brand or their PR campaigns and track and see if it was received positively and, and measure that stuff. Um, this is the sales slide. It's not that interesting to developers. So let's look a bit about uh, what, what Meltwater is uh, or what the context is where we, we are working. So we are um, 350 plus engineers. Um, we have more than 50 teams, that's engineering teams, and more than 3,000 GitHub repositories within our organization. And our main product is that we have 2.3 petabytes of data. Um, it's, it's a lot of data. Uh, and we allow, as I said, customers to search and see how did my brand do on the internet? And, and the internet is kind of this 2.3 petabyte of data. Uh, in that um, main elastic uh, cluster we have, there is more than 9 trillion search hits every month. So this is the reality of kind of our organization and the context we are working in. Uh, and we have another challenge, time zones. Uh, we are highly distributed. Uh, we have engineering offices across the world. Uh, me and Jessica, we have been working from the Gothenburg office, uh, but we collaborate with people and there's plenty of different cultures and different time zones, as I said, and just tons of people. So that's our reality. That's the context we are working, working in. And with that, let's kick off the presentation and I'll hand it over to you, Jessica. Thank you. So when we started out, and now I'm talking like, a few years back, it was, this was back when I joined uh, the company in 2016, we were still split up between developers and operations. Why I focus on developers and operations is because we are going to focus heavily in this talk on the parts of developer, uh, de developing and operating systems in our talk about DevOps. There are, of course, many more parts of doing DevOps, but these are the ones that we are going to focus on. So back in the days, we were split up. And we had developer teams that were in charge of building features for the customer. And they uh, just they got the collaboration with the product teams and they uh, designed and built features. And then there was operations and they were in charge of uh, the technical infrastructure and to deliver said features to the users that is like deployed to production. They were also in charge of developing the infrastructure, making sure it stayed up to date and developed with the times. And from the beginning, this was, was a very good model for Meltwater because uh, it allowed us to grow very fast. It allows the developers to focus on features uh, while separating the concerns of technical infrastructure to the operations team. Over time, we scaled up, as most companies do, and we scaled up a lot on developers, but not so much on operations. 
that means that there was so much more to happen uh, to do in operations and they were more stressed. And as this was developing, they were starting to build up a wall in between the developers and operations, where developers focused heavily on the feature development and then pushed everything over to operations and they just had to solve whatever they were working with. In addition to the wall between the different departments, we also had a wall in case of silos. If you remember the map, highly distributed geographically. That means that we had the silo effect on each office, where it became like a local knowledge point. That means that if one office was doing something really good, it was not likely to spread to other offices. Equally, if one office was doing something very bad, it was also not likely to spread. I guess good and bad, but still that was the case. Coming along, this ended up to be not so good, as you can imagine, uh, because we wanted to change. And the reason why we wanted to change is because we ended up in a state where we had constant firefighting in production. This means that there were things breaking, customers were impact, and it was not working out that great. Operations were very overloaded and they had a lot of things to do. And there was no longer any time for innovation for them. They couldn't do this, uh, finding out what new good infrastructure we needed. And there was no time for the long-term improvements because they were constantly trying to firefight the last fire. And on the development side, this was also not good because it started to get hard to push things through to production. And it was hard to get things out to the users who not, in addition to not having a stable service, also didn't get new features out. So there was a very long time to market for new changes. So what we wanted to do was that we wanted to look at our developers and operations. We wanted to remove the wall and squeeze them together. Wait, it's not really that simple, right? No, it's not, of course not. It's so much more to it. But basically what we did was that we said, this is not working, we need to do something else. So we decided that we should empower our teams. What do you mean by empowering our teams? Well, the idea was to have the power in a team to take something from the idea that is like the beginning, uh, the discovery, finding out what to build and have the building everything and going to the part where you push that to the end user. That means that they should have a cross-functional team. They need to have the product discovery. They need to have the developers, need to have the testers, need to have the operations part. And when we decided to do this, we decided to uh, that every team should be autonomous. And what autonomous meant for us was to each team have the power, the ownership, and the responsibility to deliver their services. And as a part of this, we also introduced on-call because if you don't check on your responsibility, then you don't really uh, own it. So this is where we ended up. So now I'm a bit scared because I was hired to kind of deliver innovative features and to uh, uh, cater to the customer needs. Uh, I was hired as an app developer to to write new cool features, fix bugs, or improve existing features. Uh, and that was my expertise. That was what, what lured me into this job. But now that we tear down the wall, I know that it takes a lot more to get a production worthy app out there. You need to document, you need to check the networking, load balancers, security, monitoring, logging, continuous integration, staging, production, and then you write the business logic. So now that we tear down this wall, does that mean that everybody has to be an expert at everything, Jessica? Well, introducing the platform team. So I think this is the reason why we introduced the platform team. At the same time, as we decided to tear down this wall and start working more with DevOps fully, we also introduced a so-called platform team that is my past team. And the idea was that there are these things that every team is going to need. There are things that uh, every developer struggle with. As you say, you need logging and you need metrics, but you are not going to be uh, unique in that. You are going to be uh, one of many that is going to need these things. So if you introduce a platform team, the idea is that they can take these common tools and products that every team needs and provide that as a service internally. That means that you don't have to build logging. You don't have to build these things. 
uh, because the platform team will build it for you and you can just utilize it instead. For us, Kubernetes is such a tool as well because everyone needs to deploy to production, but instead of everyone running their own Kubernetes cluster, which is quite a hurdle, then they can just hook on to the platform team Kubernetes cluster. So what do you think about that, Ola? Are you more comfortable? I feel a bit more comfortable, uh, but I, I can see the question that is on every people's mind right now. I can see it in their eyes. I, I can't really see it in your eyes, but I can hear it on my hard drives. And that question is that, did you just change the name of your former operations team to the platform team? And that was it. Uh, and I would have to say that there's a big difference here. And something you have to consider is that where do you put your boundaries of responsibility? And the boundaries of responsibility is something I made up for this presentation. Uh, I don't think you will get a lot of hits on Google if you, if you Google for it. But what I mean with boundaries of responsibility is that in the old world, we, the app team, the, we delivered an application. Uh, might it be a web app or a backend service? Then we threw it over the wall to the operations team and said, this is now your responsibility. You should put this in production. You should drive that and make sure that that happens. Now, the difference with having a platform team is that they just enable you to take an ID and put it in production but you have the responsibility all the way. And that's a lot of words, but I, I thought that I would show you a bit more examples of what we mean with this and how we actually work with this. Uh, as Jessica said, one of the starting things you need is somewhere to put your application. If you just have an application that is super shiny, but on your local disk, it might not be worth that much. So we quickly realized that every team needs somewhere to put their applications. Uh, in our case, our runtime environment is Kubernetes. You pro produce Docker containers or Docker images, and it's, it's there offered from the platform team to put this on Kubernetes. And after you have an environment, you also need some, some way to put your app there. And something that a lot of team uses is continuous integration. You need some kind of way to put your app together, compile it or build it, and, and then ship it. And what the platform uh, team offers, or what the platform, if we look at it as, as an entity offers, is a continuous integration solution for us. That's their responsibility. They enable us with the continuous integration. Now, my team, on the other hand, we design our build pipelines. That's our responsibility. Uh, if my team develops a node app, well, we are the only one who knows the instructions that needs to be given to, to build this app. And uh, if it's a job app, a job app that should be running on port 8080, that's my team's knowledge and maybe it should be our responsibility as well. So we mostly deliver Docker images as our final deliverable. And it makes sense for us to, to give the instructions for whatever should be in, in the Docker file. So let's jump into some code and I will show you how this actually looks. Now, we have a repository here. And the platform team put a lot of research and choose a continuous integration product, something that could build our app together. And they choose something that's called drone. And they told us that, hey, drop a drone.yaml in here, and we will start to build your things. Super nifty. Now, what we do is that we define what we, what we need to define. So one build step could be that, hey, I want to build my app. And my team have chosen to do a, a dependency management system that's called Gradle. So, hey, you should build this using Gradle. After we have built that image, as I said, my team often delivers Docker images. So we define the recipe that after you have compiled my app, put it in a Docker container. And on line 37 here, you can see that, hey, perform a Docker build with 
the instructions we gave you. And that's our responsibility. Now, two step, it's not that cool maybe. Like continuous integration, a lot of teams have solved that. Uh, it's, it's not that sexy to have something that just puts your app together. But I've been in teams previously, even as small as three people, where we had to maintain our own build machine, whether it be a Jenkins machine or something else. And that takes tons of time. Now, if you look at the responsibilities here, it's the platform team's responsibility to know that the continuous integration product is in good shape. If the disk starts to become full, well, that's up to them. And it's our responsibility of how we use it. Breaking up a bit, Ola. Can you repeat? Well, we use the. Oh, thanks. So I don't know where you where I got cut off, but we have the continuous integration yes. usage. Yeah, you just wrapped up the continuous integration. Cool. So and next step for that is to uh, to put your app in a continuous delivery fashion. You also want to, after you have built it, deploy it. And since the platform team offers both the continuous integration product and Kubernetes, it makes sense that they have something that seamlessly builds this together. And for us, we do that with Drone as well. If we go back to our recipe, we see that, well, it's just another step in our continuous integration instructions. So after we have built up, after we have built the Docker image, we now say, please deploy this to staging. Whenever we push to master, this should be deployed. And we'll take ownership of that. It's, it's working when it's deployed. Now, after a while, you might see that, hey, there are other things that could be very useful for a lot of different app teams. In our case, the next step was kind of metrics. We know that we want to have metrics to know how our app is doing. Uh, as Jessica said, we have an on-call schedule. We have to know how our applications are doing and if they are not behaving, we should get alerted. And now the platform suddenly offers metrics for us. Hey, if you expose in your app an endpoint that is slash metrics, we can pull that and we can get information, harvest those log persist or harvest those metrics, persist them and display them to you. Now for us, we still have some work to do here. If we look at uh, what we have to do is of course, first to expose, uh, sorry, wrong file. What we have to do first is of course to expose this metric standpoint. That's on us. That's how we buy into what the platform team is offering. And that's quite simple. Hey, now we have a way to, to harvest our metrics. But of course, something that really is on us and really should be in our responsibility is to say, well, what kind of metrics make sense for your app? Example, we use something called Prometheus for this. Uh, and I'm going to go to that. Uh, and we are the only ones, the app team is, are the only ones who know, hey, what kind of metrics make sense for, for your app? Maybe we start to write uh, a counter, which is how much has the feature been used? Then register this, uh, this metric. It's we who know the behavior of the app, so we take responsibility for the metrics we expose. Now, how these are har harvested or how I can use them, I don't have to know the details here. Again, that's responsibility is on the platform team. So 
the more you work and the more you collaborate and, and see what the different teams are using, you'll see that the platform starts to, to grow. They start to offer a lot of different things, load balancing, monitoring, logging, etc. And after a while, you'll realize that, oh, we can start to form conventions here. As long as we know what we buy into and how we wire this together, if we follow those conventions, we can have a really easy time getting something production worthy in production. And in our case, we are using microservices. So we kick off new services quite a lot. I think today we have 30 services running. So for us, it made sense to start something which we call the starter app. And what the starter app is for us, is just a template, a repository. And what we do is that we say, I want to kick off a new project name. It's called NDC Oslo. And then I want to execute some setup scripts on it. So it will ask me what's your GitHub username. It will ask me what is your GitHub token. And this is kind of where I cheated a bit because I have to put in some secrets here. So uh, I pre-cooked a version for you. Now what you see after you have gone through all of these setup scripts where it asks you for what logging index you want to put it in and, and what the, the service name should be, et cetera. You'll end up with a lot of modified files. You will have a Kubernetes file where we define how that should be deployed to Kubernetes. You'll have the metrics, which we talked about. You have the drone file, which, which we also covered. And at this point, all you do is that you add all your changes and then you'll do a git commit, first commit. Now, well, you push. And you really should authenticate yourself to, with SSH before you do this, but then you push. And since we have bought into all these conventions, what now happens is that we are starting to see that our build pipeline is kicking off. Now we prepared a bit. So you, as you see, this is my 25th first commit. Um, but you'll start to get the pipeline going. And what that pipeline will do for you is all of these steps that you as an app team have defined. You build your app, you push the Docker image, and then you deploy it to staging. Now, something else that the platform team offers for us is automatic, uh, automatic DNS registration. So now that our app is up and running, well, actually we could just go to another shell and we could curl our new feature. Uh, and I will show you how we kind of implement the feature like this now. We have the feature usage. Let's go to one of our endpoints and create this new feature. So let's do uh, get and report metrics. We want to expose a feature endpoint. And when we get the feature, something we might want to do is to say, hey, I want to log, cool feature. I might also want to say that Hey, the, the feature use um, metric that we just before wrote, please increase that. And then after that, well, maybe just uh, respond with the text feature. That's what we did. Let's uh, commit that up to our uh, our repository. We'll do a very good commit message, which is the second commit. Now the pipeline is building. If you go back to our, our drone or continuous integration product, well, now the second commit is there and it will deploy it to production for us. So now if we start to curl our new feature that we implemented, You'll see that we get a cool feature. I will spam this a bit. 
to see that we are increasing our metrics and our logging. Because if we look at the second page here, that from team has now started to harvest our logs. They are starting to uh, persist them to disk or whatnot. I, I don't really have to know or care, but what I care about is that I can see how my app is used over time. And this is something that the platform team takes responsibility for. We use Grafana on top of Prometheus and all of that operational um, cost is on the platform team. They offer this as a product to me. Now I of course have to define what should the graph plot? What should the name of the graph be, et cetera. Um, and if we look even further, we'll also see that oh, we start to get logging for free. We just buy into the conventions and we start to consume our logs with our very responsible log messages. But the fact that this is up, how the retention policy of the logs, et cetera, are, well, that's the platform team's responsibility. And for my team, it really ends up in being, well, look at all of these things you have to do to get a production worthy app into production. Well, now that we have bought into what the platform team offers and follow the conventions that we have taken forward, well, we can focus on writing the business logic. Just as in the case I just did when we wanted to do a new feature endpoint, a super cool feature. We checked out an app, followed our setup scripts, committed, and then we started to implement the feature. And then we are good to go. And for us, it, it ripples down to buy versus build. Now we could decide that we want to build this ourselves. We want to have our own, our own continuous integration solution or our own metric solution or our own logging solution. But we'd rather buy into to Jessica's team. They work eight hours a day with this. We will never be better than them at this. What is cool at Meltwater is that if we decide that we have this very special use case where we build something with, I don't even know, we are allowed to go for our own solutions. So if Jessica's team's offerings doesn't doesn't meet our requirements, we are free to do it on our own. And it really comes down to autonomy. Jessica has, has named this before, and it's a key point in this kind of DevOps experience. And we are allowed to have an ID and then push it out into production. And there is nothing stopping us. We don't have to throw something over the wall and wait a few days. And as Jessica said as well, we are focusing on the developer experience here today, the engineering part of it. But if you start to design your team so that you also have a product owner within the team and you have the business knowledge there as well, well, suddenly you are fully autonomous to just take an ID out into production in the matter of whatever it takes to write the business logic. So that is really, really important to, to us. And with that, I'll hand over to Jessica to talk a bit more about what it means to be in a platform team. Yeah, so well, I showed you very well how it looks like when you're buying into a platform team and how easy it can become for a developer when doing that. As a platform team, since Ola's team has fully autonomous, they can choose to either build it themselves, they can choose to use ours, or they can choose to buy a third party. It's very important that we as a platform team deliver a product. We cannot just deliver a bundle of scripts that we're not going to maintain, take care or support because that is not going to work out in the long run. So we need to build products that we deliver and we need to see them as products because when we don't, we don't take all the ownership of our services and we don't provide them as we should. So anything in the cloud is a competition to us. We are uh, in the AWS, uh, which means that most, they have a very wide range of products, as you probably know. 
And that is what we're competing with. If AWS provides something that is better than what we provide, teams are going to choose their product rather than ours. And while it's not a competition, the idea is to make the team spend as little effort as possible on things that are not building business logic, which means that if they are going to set up an AWS product as something they use, they are going to have to spend time maintaining that. If they uh, chose to show something that we built, then we will help them maintain it. So we compete with the cloud, we compete with anything that is self-built by the teams, and what we deliver have to be either a better product, and it, or it could have more features, or it could be better integrated with existing products and tools. And to look at this critically, uh, we are very small, we cannot compete with AWS, but what we can do is that we can have a better integrating with the other existing tools and products that we have. So as Ula showed, if you run in our Kubernetes, we make sure that logs and the metrics work out. If you run in the continuous integration platform, we make it easy to deploy to Kubernetes as well. Stuff like that is something where we can have our competing edge. And we started out with container orchestration. We started out with our platform team. There's a few reasons for that. Um, mainly it's because it allows a very easy access for development environments uh, to uh, deployment environments for the teams. And this was a very good step to allow full responsibility and ownership for the teams when we started out with the DevOps style. For us, container orchestration means Kubernetes. Currently, it's been a path. It wasn't always Kubernetes, but that's the current solution. So we launched the effort around Kubernetes for two and a half years ago. And by then, the offerings in AWS was very limited. I don't know if you know about EKS, which is the uh, Elastic uh, Kubernetes service, I think. Um, it was not uh, out of beta yet. It was not even in an open beta position, which means, and it was like no, not the directives on when it would go uh, general available. So we decided to self-host and um, that is challenging to some extent, but it also gained us more flexibility in how we chose to configure and what we chose to uh, do and integrate. And we decided to use COPS as a cluster management yeah, manager. When I say cluster management, what do I mean really? Because COPS is really just a tool for spinning up Kubernetes, configuring the versions and settings, et cetera. But there's so much more to cluster managing than that. So some of the tasks that we as a platform team perform and take care of that the teams don't ever have to care about is kind of like when you're running a large cluster, sometimes a node will become unavailable or like it will be scheduled for maintenance and stuff. And I would say with the current workload that we're running, that happens like five times a week that we have to uh, remove a node from the cluster. This is something that the teams don't have to care about. We, as Ula mentioned, like he's on call for his application, but if Kubernetes breaks, he doesn't want to fix it, which I understand. So is it working? We care about that. We're monitoring a lot of things and we're keeping track of it and we make sure that it's constantly available. And also like upgrades, Kubernetes has like four upgrades, like new major versions per year. No, not major, sorry, minor versions. Uh, 118 was like released a month ago or something. And on top of that, there's security patches and stuff like that that you need to take care of. This is something that would require a lot of time for the teams if they were involved in. So when we started out with Kubernetes, we didn't scale up to the level where we are today. We started out very small. And it was very intentional. We decided to take one team, Ula's team, to be our pilot customer for this. And we decided to ourselves also be our pilot customers because it's very good if you use your own product because then you realize, realize what works and what doesn't. So we started very small with two teams to discover what was needed. And we discovered quite early on that automagical DNS recreation was very useful because when you spin up something and run something, you want to expose it then you might want to have a DNS connected to it. And um, at the beginning, we ran like somewhere around 10 services. It wasn't that big. I do remember this clearly because we had just tried it out and we were like, okay, let's just put some staging services on here. Let's not go production yet because we don't know how stable it is. Let's take it slowly. We turned around for a week and we came back and they was running in production with like five services. Uh, so users never listen, uh, but it was a good experience and we learned a lot. And it was also very small. We had like 10, 20 nodes or something. 
and we had around 16 species. And namespace is something that you can consider as a separation of concern. How we decided to separate it is environment and team. So each team has a separate namespace for each of their environments. So for instance, Ola's team has a dev staging and a production namespace. Same for my team. As we started out as well, and we started running things, we realized quickly that there are some things that we can connect with our existing offerings, such as logging. Introducing auto magical log harvesting. How it worked before, so we are running the Elk stack, Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. Uh, this has been an established product since before we started with the Kubernetes work. And how it works usually is that the users, they send the logs to Logstash, who then uh, start processing it, store it in Elasticsearch, and then Kibana sends queries to Elasticsearch, which shows it in the user interface. But we thought that we should make this as easy as possible. Why should every user have to configure where to send the logs? Because we know where the logs are. They are in the container and it's running on Kubernetes. We can find it. So we set up FileBit. What happens is that FileBit runs as a so-called daemon set in Kubernetes. That means that it's running on every worker and node that you have in the cluster. And then it harvests the log from the containers and it sends it forward to Logstash and Elasticsearch. So basically, you just cut out the part where the user have to know where to send the logs, making sure that it arrives there. And we do that for them. And a little bit about our Elk stack, because it's quite large. As Ola mentioned, we handle a lot of searches. Uh, and we also, to manage those searches, we also store a lot of information. So that means that our logging cluster handles uh, around 240 terabytes of log messages. And it is capable of handling around 300,000 log messages per second. If you feel like you don't really know how much that is, I can tell you it's not maybe Google much, but it's a lot. It's probably more than a lot of people have to handle. And we have done a lot of tuning to make sure that it can handle this. And those 240 terabytes logs uh, is with a 32 days retention. Uh, so this is how it looks. Um, In addition to logs, we also have the uh, metrics harvesting, as Ola mentioned. And we had used Prometheus before, but not as user. Uh, we had used it more for an internal platform, internal products, and not for user metrics uh, before we started with Kubernetes. But when we started with Kubernetes, since Prometheus is playing very nicely with Kubernetes, we decided to provide it as a, use, uh, a way to users to send the metrics as well. And it was important for us to have it a very low effort to get started as well, because since no one was used to using Prometheus before, we need to make it as simple as possible. So this is kind of how our setup looks. Uh, we're using an uh, open source tool called Thanos in combination with Prometheus, and that is to make sure that we don't have gaps in metrics in case one instance of Prometheus is restarted as it needs to be done when you are updating it, for instance. The reason why we care about this is because otherwise there is a risk for clapping metrics. If you take this picture and you imagine that the middle one Thanos is not there, uh, so from Grafana it goes directly to the Prometheus instances. In case one goes away, there is a risk that uh, Grafana tries to uh, send a request to the one that is not currently existing. Or even worse, when it comes back and you ask it what happened five minutes ago and it hasn't collected metrics, so it doesn't know then you get a glapping metric. That is why we chose to work with Thanos. So we have Thanos running as a sidecar on each Prometheus instance, and then we have a tool called Thanos Query in the middle. What Thanos Query does is that it, uh, Grafana communicates with Thanos Query, and then Thanos Query asks all the real Prometheus instances, what are your metrics for this time frame? It aggregates them and makes sure to remove duplicates, which means that in case one has restarted, you will still be able to get a full picture. Or even if two restarted in like separate times, you will still get the full picture of metrics. Why is it so important with not having gaps in metrics, you ask me? Glad you asked. So this is how it could look when you're having a graph in Grafana 
and this is how we can look. You see the red line, thin red line in the middle. That's a configured alert. And this is messages. So I think this is a message queue. And I would assume that if in case the queue moves above the line for a certain amount of time, this is going to page. What happens if there is a glap in metrics? Well, part of the graph would disappear. And if you haven't done a custom uh, setting on your metric uh, alert, that is going to page you because not having any data is usually defaulted as paging. And I don't want to page Ola because I restarted Prometheus instance. He will not want to be paged because I restarted Prometheus instance. And of course, there is a possibility of changing your alert setting to not page in case of missing data, but that requires an extra thing for every alert our users set up. And there's a huge risk of missing one or two. And we don't want to page people unless absolutely necessary. Hence, we don't want gaps in metrics. Over the time, Kubernetes grew a lot. So in two years, we moved from the two teams and they are about 10 services and 10 to 20 nodes and to 30 teams, 100, 1100 services, three to 400 nodes and around a hundred namespaces. This is quite a lot growth. And 30 teams might not sound so much when Ulla mentioned that we have around 45, but not all of those 45 teams have a need for running the Kubernetes. So all in all, we have a very high adoption rate of our internal teams on running in Kubernetes, which is super cool. And the reason why it says three to 400 nodes is because I honestly don't know where we are today because it changes from hour to hour. It goes up and down because we have enabled auto scaling because depending on the workload and the use case that our users has, they're going to need more or less nodes available. And that's, uh, that's not something we want to do manually, so we made sure that it happened with automatic. And getting to this place, this high adoption rate, we had to have a very high collaboration rate with the teams because through close collaboration with them, we managed to find out what their needs were, what their pain points were. Like we had to do continuous customer discovery to better understand what solution they needed, and we had to do it continuously over and over and over. And we didn't get all the things right away. So we found out for each team we onboarded, we found out what are your use cases? Do you can, is it enough with what we have available? Do we need to add something else on? And when we added something else, we went back to the old users. We said, hey, this is now available. And some people were like, oh my God, this is everything I could ever dream of. But, uh, and some didn't care. So it's very different, but it's important to have close collaboration with your team uh, teams because they don't always know what to ask for, because as we, as, as we mentioned, some of these things are not that com uh, comfortable or like it's not something that they are that used to work with. So they might know what their problem is, but they might not know what solution they need. So, and we need to continuously work with improvement. So we can't just, what we deployed two and a half years ago when we started out, it, it would not have worked out today. You need to continuously improve it and do continuous customer discovery to know in which direction to improve it. And the more things you connect, the easier it is to buy into new products. So the connection between the continuous integration pipeline and the uh, Kubernetes cluster was very vital to make it easy to have a good deployment pipeline and build pipeline for uh, services. To have the connection to the logs was also very important because to know that it's working and the same for the metrics and be, uh, be able to set up your alerts and stuff. And you're not really done because you release one. You, so you have to do this continuously all the time. Some of the lessons learned, I would say, is you don't need a complete solution day one. Uh, you have to work in small increments because I know some things that we were talking about very early on in this project that never became true. It was never realized. So if we had tried to implement it and run that from day one, we probably would not have been able to release for over a year. As it were, we spent a couple of months on implementation before we brought in the first team on releasing. And it's very important to not, well, I don't know. The developers I know really like to be told, do this thing. 
they rather know what their options are and made the decisions themselves. So the idea is not to say now everyone has to use Kubernetes because trust me, it's not going to work. But what you can do is you can create a paved road that is so comfortable to walk on and so easy and moving in the direction where people want to go that they prefer to take that road rather than make their own. And I think it's also important to understand that Ola mentioned it before with edge cases, but there will be edge cases and you don't have to try to solve them all because that's not the purpose here. The purpose is to try to make it as easy as possible for as many as possible, because the idea is to make every development team move as fast as possible. So if you spend all the problem, uh, all the effort on solving the problem for one specific team that is not uh, applicable to any other team, you spent the effort in the wrong place. Instead, if you solve the use case that most teams will have, that's where effort should go. So if a lot of things we talked about feel strange or foreign, uh, I feel like it's a lot about the culture. And if you're not in a DevOps culture already, there will have to be a culture shift before you can get to this kind of place. And we talked a lot about operational parts of DevOps. And as mentioned before as well, there's so much more to it. Uh, but I think that I want to conclude it with that it's less about what tools you use than how you use them. And I think you need to find your own culture and your own tools. We use Kubernetes. I'm not telling you to use Kubernetes. That's often a misconception. Use whatever is useful for you to reach your goals. But I think also that by promoting ownership and responsibility in your teams, you will build a stable ground for our DevOps organization. So does this mean that I have to be an expert in all the things operations? I would like to say no to that question. I think that with a platform team providing products for the common use cases, the team can mainly focus on the same work as they did before, but now with more insights and more understanding to what's happening. What we have today is working well, well for us. Tomorrow, it might be different. I will even say it will be different. And we hope that we have given you some ideas and takes on how to introduce or improve your DevOps culture. And we want to acknowledge that every situation will be different. So your take will probably look different from ours, but we would love to hear what it is. So please share your story with us. And if you have any questions, uh, I should have mentioned in the beginning, but you can put them in the chat and we will try to answer them now because I think we have a few more minutes or you can post them in Slack and we will respond there. Any final words, Ola? No, uh, I think uh, you covered it all. Uh, I think there is an option to unmute the mic, so we could take questions uh, via via questions as well. Or yeah, as Jessica said, write them in the chat. Um, and I'm not quite sure how we unmute people. Uh, right, maybe we're supposed to do something around that. Hi. Uh, people, can, uh, people can unmute themselves. So if you have a question, then feel free to just uh, click the little microphone, the red microphone icon, and that should unmute you. There we go. So I don't have a question, but it seems that there are quite two interesting ones in the Slack. Yes, I just saw this too. Uh, I can try to answer these. Uh, so how do you handle stateful infrastructure and their credentials, uh, databases, message queues, etc.? In general, we use AWS built-in products for this. So for instance, uh, we don't have, uh, we platform don't provide database as a service, for instance. Uh, so the teams own their own databases in Amazon, which means that they are probably running RDS or similar. And on a similar manner, we are using SQS for message passing and uh, equal. I know some are using a rabbit solution that is bought in from a third party. Yeah, and, and uh, as I said, we, we are running a microservice architecture and it's really dependent on, on the microservice. Uh, so we are running lots of different databases, uh, but usually it's offered by AWS in that case. And the second question was also interested in internal billing. And 
this is something that we haven't spent a lot of effort on because it has never been a big thing. Uh, but recently we have spent some effort around visualizing cost spent. This is not so much for pointing fingers or, gears or stuff. It's more for empowering the teams to make insightful decisions. So for instance, that was a lot of buzzwords. Sorry about that. But what it means is some teams are spending a shit ton of money on logging and they don't even know about it. Some teams are spending a lot of time on resources in Kubernetes and they don't even know about it. So the idea with internal billing is to visualize, this is what you currently have running. This is how much resources it uses. And this is how much it costs what we are paying to AWS. But there's really no strict accountability on the cost currently. Uh, there are tools for Kubernetes uh, cost, etc. Especially when it comes to AWS, Henning Jacobs has a few open source projects and Zalando has something that you can look into if you're interested. Any other questions? I'm trying to survey all the chats. Uh, any problems with isolation in the cluster? E noise neighboring due to IO? Uh, I would say no. We haven't had any issue with that. Uh, we have no strict network policies between the namespaces. Uh, what can happen is if you don't put resource uh, requests on your uh, pods, they might be terminated when something else is consuming more. But this is something that you can do yourself and it's not impacted by someone else directly. And we had a few instances where someone was wondering why their staging application was restarting a lot and that was due to not defining the resources required by that instance. And that is something that today is, is based on, on trust, basically. Uh, we don't have, as Jessica said, like networking policy, uh, and that works out quite good for us. It even makes sometimes, if you if you know what you're doing, you might want to break it as long as you, you have informed the other team about it. Um, but it's a lot about communication. And if we had seen that that was a big problem, well, that would maybe have been something that, that trickled up uh, the, the platform team's backlog. In, in yeah, I would say definitely if it was a problem, we would have prioritized it, uh, but it has not been a problem. Uh, and we, uh, I think what could happen is if someone decides to spin up a hundred thousand pods that would fuck things up, but sorry, <clears throat> uh, but uh, that has not happened um, except for the one, the test cluster that we made at uh, that conference that everyone broke, but that was intentional. So nothing wrong uh, in general. Uh, People will not do stupid things if you make it easy for them to do right. I think that's uh, something to take on. Less rules, easy to make it right. Cool. I think if maybe we have another follow-up question, I can see typing. Uh, Let's give it a few more, few more seconds. Yeah. Or minutes. I think this might be it, to be honest. If there's any additional questions, we will uh, monitor Slack for a while and we will respond to questions there. Uh, feel free to ping us if it takes like a few more minutes before you're writing a question. Uh, thanks a lot for listening. Thanks a lot.